Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the session on building successful partnerships and uh, the role of mobile network operators in, in mHealth. Uh, there have been uh, a couple of sessions already on, on partnership developments. There was one uh, an hour and a half ago, actually, interestingly, on, uh, on public-private partnerships, focused very much on, uh, on emerging markets and a big, a big uh, uh, focus on, on healthcare. So we're going to try and carry on a lot of that conversation with messaging into particularly the mobile network operators. And uh, we'll start with just a, a, a an overview of what GSMA members are doing around the world. Um, my name is, is Craig Fredericks. Um, I head up healthcare at the GSMA. And for those of you who don't know the GSMA, um, we represent the interests of mobile network operators globally. Um, that includes more than 800 um, operators or carriers, as, as they're often called in, in the US. Um, we represent around 98% of, of that mo mobile, uh, mobile industry. And also included in that membership are around 250 associate members. So the broader mobile ecosystem um, uh, also partner with us and our members to, to uh, expand their, their, their networks and their, and their products. Um, just something on the reach of those 98% of mobile network operators around the world. Um, we've done, a, we've done a, uh, a study earlier this year across the membership and found that um, uh, the majority of those network operators are, are launching or involved in, in healthcare in, in one form or another. Um, what we have here is just the representation of a global reach. So, you know, overstated um, really is the potential of, of selling services or healthcare services into that. Um, mobile operator reach, um, but here you can see it, it really it represents 62% um, of a global population or 3.7 billion uh, GSM uh, connections. So the conversion rate when you look at that comparatively to, to healthcare is really is, is astounding. So really wanting to understand from our, from our panelists how we, can, how we can leverage partnership opportunities and extend uh, the reach of healthcare more effectively. What we're seeing, and I apologize for the, uh, for the size of the writing on this, on this slide, um, but just a representation of what's happening in, in different regions amongst the GSM uh, members. Um, I'll just read out a, a couple of interesting stats. We see in, in Western Europe, 24% of uh, mobile operators in that region are involved in healthcare. That equates to 357 million mobile subscribers, 12% across Eastern Europe, and that converts into 253 million subscribers. Middle East, 37%. Uh, Asia Pacific, 37%. Africa, only 10%. Um, but that's slightly skewed in, in that uh, the 10% of mobile operators that have interest in mobile health are really the dominant, dominant mobile operators and control more than 80% of, of mobile connections across Africa. Uh, the Americas, uh, North Africa, 8%, 8%, um, and then, uh, and then uh, the South America is 13%, um, also representing nearly a, a quarter of a billion mobile, uh, mobile connections. So with, with that, I'm going to, to just introduce some of our panelists. I'm going to ask them for opening remarks of three minutes. We'll then have uh, moderated uh, questions and then open up to, to the floor and really encourage, uh, as I said, the continuation of conversations that have been happening both formally on, on other panel uh, discussions as well as informally around Exhibition Hall and, and in, the, uh, in the corridors. If you could just make your way to one of the microphones in the middle when you do have a question and, um, and we'll get to you as soon as we can. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Benjamin Sarda. Um, Benjamin is the director of product, uh, or is the is the director of product marketing at Orange Healthcare. Um, Orange Healthcare aims to develop e-health activities in France and internationally leverage the France Telecom Orange Group's expertise in information and communication technologies. Benjamin was previously chief of staff to uh, Terry Zebelberg, executive vice president of Orange Healthcare. Uh, Orange have formed innovative partnerships and secured 
health tenders in France to deliver connected hospitals. Um, and very interesting to notice, and uh, which we'll pick up on later in, in this discussion, is, uh, is around just compliance to French and, and European health and safety standards and how this has created significant partnership opportunities. Uh, Benjamin, over to you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Is it working? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. So, uh, as Greg said, for Arrange, he health is a huge opportunity. We're working in lots of different fields. Uh, we believe he health breaks down into different categories, lots of categories. Uh, we have services for professional, services for remote management, and of course services for consumers. Uh, these, are, these are completely different markets, uh, but there are some common points. One of them is it always starts with good partners. Uh, we partner with diverse manufacturers, we partner with software players, uh, of course we partner with healthcare players to design uh, products and services. Just as an opening remark, uh, I mentioned that we, we partner with healthcare player. This is really key because uh, most of the time uh, in such conferences, people are talking about healthcare uh, being led by patient, uh, being led by wellness. Uh, we truly believe that there is no such thing as patient-led revolution in healthcare and that services must start with good understanding of what healthcare players are doing and what they want to achieve. Thanks very much, Benjamin. Um, Carlos Martinez is head of uh, strategy and innovation at Telefonica Digital's eHealth Global Business Unit um, since the unit was created. Uh, with over 13 years of experience in Telefonica and until the end of uh, 2010, he was in charge of ICT projects and services for enterprise and public administration customers. Uh, Telefonica Digital is a global business division of Telefonica. Its mission is to seize the opportunities within the digital world and deliver new growth for Telefonica. Uh, for potential partners, um, Telefonica Digital represents a gateway to over 300 million customers and operations in 25 different countries, in addition to operators in which uh, Telefonica has equity stakes, including China Unicom and uh, Telecom Italia. Carlos, um, can you just explain a little bit more about the opportunities here for M Health stakeholders? Yeah, thank you, Craig. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And in these 25 countries, we are focusing, we have decided to narrow our focus and to focus on three primary markets Spain, the UK, and Brazil, and with a very clear strategy with a few very selected products and services, starting with remote patient management or monitoring, which is our main bet, in which we are partnering with key opinion leaders in the healthcare sector in those three countries and with a variety, variety of different providers from consultancy companies to system integrator to medical content providers to medical device manufacturers in order to build an end-to-end -end service that helps the providers and the payers to increase efficiency and that brings better quality for the patients. We have run some uh, clinical trials uh, which have finished already with very good results in terms of mortality reduction down to 30 percent and, and readmissions, uh, hospital readmissions reduction also in terms of between 50 to 60 percent. So we're taking this experience to, to these three markets and expect to grow exponentially less next year. We are also providing telecare services, personal emergency response systems with our own technology and developing our R&D facilities in Spain. And we have also uh, solutions partnering with third party providers. Some of them are here like Nuance for instance for voice recognition in order to automate different processes in healthcare administration to cope with uh, different uh, things like medical appointments from the establishment of the appointment up to the reminders in order to, to get the appointment finally closed by the, the patient and taking this into a next phase uh, through services, innovative services like teletriage, uh, making some kind of screening or filtering of the patient through a multi-channel platform to provide them with the appropriate response to the need they have. So we are building all these services always with partners and we believe there is huge potential for all of them. 
Thanks very much, uh, Carlos. Um, Eleanor Chai leads uh, AT&T's product team to conceptualize and bring to market a suite of expertise uh, or enterprise offerings in the mobility, healthcare, and pharmaceutical space. Her mHealth and pharma product team develops solutions that draw on best of breed uh, mobile connectiveness, um, ap applications, and wireless devices to improve healthcare outcomes and reduce the cost of care. Uh, AT&T is developing solutions in the areas of disease management, medication adherence, remote care monitoring, as well as an enterprise mobilization for mHealth tools and infrastructure to support companies to achieve their mHealth aspirations. Eleanor, over to you to expand on this um, and, uh, and how partnership development helps you to deliver on some of these solutions. Uh, thank you very much. So um, I'm going to preface what I say first by saying that mobility healthcare for us is not an end. It's a means to an end. The N is connected healthcare, and we actually have our CMIO here in the audience with us, Dr. Nair. But Dr. Nair often talks about how when you think about um, whether it's mobility or connected care, is to be able to trace the path of that uh, patient or consumer all the way from uh, an encounter within the four walls of the hospital to when they're discharged, to the transitions in care, continued care management, and then, you know, being able to avert um, unnecessary hospitalizations and readmissions. Now, when we think about our complete solutions around our four health portfolio, um, as with our colleagues here from, from Orange and Telefonica, very important to have, you know, uh, partnerships with payers, with providers. Uh, but there are a, a few more that I wanted to highlight. One is actually around the strategic partnerships within the community. So we have uh, at AT&T struck a partnership with the, um, the AMA. So in this way, we are now uh, you know, uh, uh, tied in hopefully to 300 to 400,000 physicians. So that's, you know, 50% of the physician practicing market within the U.S. So that's a kind of strategic partnership we're trying to build more of. Uh, another strategic partnership, I would say, would also be the internal partnerships that we built within our business. So one of the most important partners for us within uh, this healthcare team is actually with our HR benefits. Um, why is that? Um, AT&T is not just building out a suite of solutions. We are also uh, drinking our own champagne. Uh, and we are also testing this out with AT&T employees and dependents. Um, AT&T actually covers 1.2 million lives. And you may have caught Marty Webb, our VP of uh, HR Benefits, yesterday talking about what we have rolled out within AT&T with our employee population base and the impact we've uh, achieved. Um, another uh, partnership that I want to raise, too, is this idea around the openness of working with third parties wherever they are across the value chain. So obviously we work with the big infrastructure uh, uh, partners, such as you may have seen in our press report uh, today around the uh, product that we're launching in remote care monitoring through Ericsson and Intuitive. So Ericsson is an example of a, a partner here. Uh, but also, let's not forget the, um, uh, the ISVs, the startups, the smaller companies that are developing innovative ideas. It's very important for us to keep very close to that base of innovation. We've got fast pitches. We've got our AT&T foundry. Uh, and that's where it, it may not uh, result in a direct opportunity of saying, hey, you know, this is exactly what we want to commercialize and expand on, but it helps to jog us in the right direction and allows for that free flow uh, of innovative ideas as we build out further innovation uh, in the community. Eleanor, thanks. A couple of points that we'll come back to in, in a later discussion there. Um, just a quick uh, quiz question, and we, we're very fortunate here to have uh, Lee Quinn, who is the Chief Scientist of China Mobile Research Institute. Um, any guesses for how many employees China Mobile have? Any guesses? A thousand? <laughs> 
I almost <laughs> fell over backwards when I heard this earlier, is that fi 500,000 employees and 700 million mobile subscribers. So very, very privileged to have uh, the chief scientist of, of China Mobile with us today. Um, Li Quan has been the, the chief scientist and held that position since May 2010. He leads R&D activities in M Health applications and services and is responsible for setting the viable business strategy, establishing core research competence in related technologies and building an open, scalable and intelligent platform for delivering end-to-end -end M Health services. Uh, if you've been down to the GSMA stand in the exhibition hall, you'll have noticed a number of uh, device and, and software solutions that, uh, that China Mobile are displaying. Um, and there's been an interesting conversation around uh, partnership opportunities and expansion um, of, of non-Chinese uh, companies into China and obviously of these products and services um, out, out uh, from, from China into, into other markets. So, Lee Quinn, I hope uh, that's an adequate in intro, and if you could just uh, explain that in more detail, please. Uh, thanks, Craig, and uh, thanks for uh, coming here. Uh, China Mobile, as uh, just uh, Craig mentioned, has, uh, it, it's quite different in its own right uh, compared with other uh, established companies here. Um, we have sort of and also, the Chinese uh, re market it has its unique uh, features. Um, first of all, it's a scale, as I mentioned. We have 700 million customers uh, as of last uh, latest count. And then this country has uh, experienced rapid uh, progress over the last 20, 30 years. Basically, it's the expansion, urbanization, industrialization. And this uh, come with the, life, the change of life, uh, lifestyles. It has uh, brought about all the issues, of, apart from good things, also the bad things as well. For example, the unhealthy population increase in large portions. The uh, chronic disease now count about uh, half of the deaths. And also the aging populations. Uh, the population, as you know, that China has this one-child policy. It's been running since 1980s, early 1980s. Now the populations, their parents, all become aging. So, and also this problem come as a, it's much also much bigger scales. So the resources, uh, the rapid development in China also means the uneven development. So along the coastal areas, a major city, uh, Pearl River Delta, Yangtze River Delta that people more affluent, uh, they can afford, uh, afford uh, sort of health care. But in the remote, mountainous regions, remote regions, still people are just uh, uh, have to cope with their daily lives uh, with limited resources and uh, limited access to med medical services. So the, we, for us in China, the health reform, because the you all heard that China has this 12, 12 five year plan. In this year plan, one of the major components is the Health Reform Act, which the government has promised to uh, uh, introduce this uh, medical insurance to uh, by 2020 with all the populations. But at, mo at the moment, there are three uh, insurance schemes. Uh, one is the, for urban workers, the basic uh, health insurance scheme for the long open long worker uh, child elderly and unemployed there is another scheme then there's a new scheme for new rural cooperative house uh, initiative so that means that by end of last year about 90 percent of Chinese population now has insurance uh, of certain kinds the medical insurance uh, whether in the remote area it used to be the farmers that suffer from problems, they just stay at home and do not use various other means, but now they want to access to medical re resources. So now what I'm seeing this this all the background means that the the, uh, the service for medical um, the leads for medical resources in China is not quite come to a stage. You have to the government although they uh, try to invest and uh, in encourage. Uh, 
provide, struggle, working hard to provide uh, health care for the people, but it still it, it cannot uh, by itself fulfill these objectives. Uh, so this uh, technology will, means, uh, will be now regarded as a major means to facilitate the government to achieve this uh, objective. So now we, uh, as operators, we are uh, sort of encouraged to uh, deliver different services. For, for example, for, for people in the open area, so as I said, the chronic disease, we should uh, uh, introduce solutions to, for the chronic disease management. Then for people in the remote regions, we can uh, introduce other telehealth uh, means for village doctors to look at these people. Uh, so for, for all these uh, services, uh, China Mobile is working on trying to provide. Uh, because we have the, as a telecom operator, we have the advantage. We are the biggest one among three in China. We have the courage to 97% of population and also 100% of administrative villages, which means that our network is very well. We provide the service, not just communications, but provide various information. So on top of that, now we now want to introduce a health-related information using mobile means. Um, while we are not trying to do this, we cannot do it alone, so we need the partners in various different in the value chain, uh, working with uh, device manufacturers, uh, medical health professionals, uh, solution providers. We're also working with academia and researchers, so we need uh, national and international partners to, to, to uh, join us to achieve these goals. Thank you. So very few uh, companies in the world that have a market reach of 700 million consumers. So it'll be interesting to, to understand how you actually evaluate and, and prioritize partners that can actually deliver to that, uh, to that consumer base as well. Um, Raymond uh, Duremdes, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, leads the eHealth and mHealth strategic management team at Smart Communications which is the Philippines' leading wireless network operator. Uh, Raymond is a private sector member of the Philippine Department of Health Technical Working Group on Information and Communication and Technology for Health. And this is a public-private advisory group tasked to leverage ICT into healthcare. Um, he also leads Project Shine. And if you were in the, in the uh, discussion uh, just next to this, this hall previously, uh, you would have heard from RTI, which is one of the partners on, on, that, uh, on that project. Um, this, is a, this is a mobile health partnership with the Department of Health, and Raymond, I'll ask you to expand on that for us, please. Thank you, Craig. So maybe just a little context. Uh, so our healthcare system is a devolved one, so our Department of Health is a national body and it sets policy making essentially and have some has responsibility for some vertical programs. It also operates directly just about 72 hospitals. So the bulk in, in of the delivery of healthcare services on the government side is actually done by local governments, the provincial governments who operate much of the network of uh, district hospitals, as well as city and municipal governments who operate many of the outpatient care uh, facilities that are typically one doctor, one, and one or two nurses, and maybe about five to 12 uh, midwives. So that's the sort of uh, context that we have. Uh, there's a large private sector as well, but for purposes of this discussion, I'll talk a little bit more about the government side, which actually delivers services for the majority of the, of the population, especially the, the, the base of the pyramid. So let me pick up from what Craig introduced. Uh, ICT for Health Technical Working Group uh, was convened as a private-public partnership where members of uh, private sector companies uh, like Intel is represented, Microsoft is represented, and, and some local private companies, as well as representatives from the Department of Health and uh, University of the Philippines as, 
and, and also the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. So there's a, almost like a half and half split among government people and, and private uh, people. So the, the main mandate of that group, and it was basically, a, it's a pro bono group, uh, but it was, you know, uh, mandated with a personal department order so signed by the Secretary of Health. So it stipulates, you know, the composition as well as the, the deliverables of that group. And um, essentially, its um, output uh, are in three, in four areas. One is an enterprise architecture for the Department of Health and all the, the relevant agencies in healthcare delivery. Second, um, standards, technical standards that have a lot to do with interoperability. Um, third are basically a set of recommendations on governance and how to go about, uh, you know, making sure these things will happen and actually ensuring that systems that are developed uh, will conform to the standards. And the fourth area of recommendations was in um, capacity building, knowing that there's a gap between the here and now uh, in terms of, you know, what institutions as well as individuals in the healthcare system actually have today in terms of knowledge and skills, as well as the, you know, the vision of basically ubiquitous uh, healthcare enabled by technology. So the, the group worked for about a year and uh, came out with recommendations. Uh, the WHO sort of helped vet the recommendations of the group and basically came up with uh, with some minor uh, adjustments to the recommendation. So, so that, that sort of now serves as a general framework for, for, the, for the healthcare industry, if you will, for the Philippines. It's not yet official, but people sort of started moving around ideas that came out of that set of recommendations. So let me, let me switch over to the work that we did uh, in what we call Project Shine. So Shine is S-H-I-N-E. It's actually a, a uh, well, it's, it, it's an acronym for Secured Health Information Network and Exchange. It's uh, essentially a system for ambulatory care facilities where they could do four basic functions. They could, and we, I'd like to explain that in four R's, record, remind, refer, and report. So there's a recording function, which means that healthcare workers, as they take in patients, can register patients in a, essentially a, an electronic registry, record the uh, interactions um, with the patient, so essentially consultations and diagnosis and services provided. Um, in many cases, also set up follow-up uh, activities, so, you know, in a calendar-driven way, so an SMS can be set up, for example, a, a pregnant woman goes for a consultation and is set for a follow-up visit, uh, you know, a couple of months down the, down the road, so a, a, an SMS set for delivery a day or two or a few days before that agreed consultation follow-up will be set up and, it, you know, you set it up and, and it will be delivered on that day. So that's a sort of a reminder for consultations and services and also medication. The third R is uh, um, referring. So when a particular case can't be handled by the ambulatory care or outpatient care facility, then it's referred typically to a district hospital or ultimately to a tertiary hospital in the city. And so it's structured health data or health records about the patients can move among these facilities. So we do not install it in hospitals uh, as a part of a full hospital information system, but basically just take the data of the patient up to the doorstep of the hospital. So that's the third R. The fourth R is about automating or auto-generating reports that are mandated by the Department of Health. So to, to alleviate the burden and the, the time spent by many of these frontline health workers who spend a lot of time just filling up paper reports today. And so part of the, of the value to them is to, to basically save time from working on these reports as they are now can be, you know, automatically generated from the recording that takes place day to day. So that's four hours. And uh, so it's delivered as both as a web and mobile 
um, electronic system. For the most part, people stay within a facility. They look at a PC connected through a wireless broadband uh, network. And for midwives, who by and large go out and they man about uh, maybe two or three uh, village outpost uh, facilities. So they go out and also go on home visits. So they have a mobile phone with, a, with some application in it to do some of the functions that can be performed with the computer. So it's both a web and mobile um, service. The, uh, the stakeholders in the partnership network involved in Project Shine um, are the national government who provided a lot of the the thought leadership and guidance and protocols and standards and practices. Also, many of the local governments. So we have to actually go around in a pilot area in central Philippines to talk to 13, 14 different mayors and, and the municipal health officers uh, as they are the key decision makers to make this project happen. So there's uh, national and local governments. We also work closely with uh, NGOs that are partly funded by, by development facilities. So let, let me maybe stop there and, and I'll be happy to take questions later on. Thanks very much, Raymond. Um, a couple of interesting things coming out there. I think the, uh, the diversity of partners, the diversity of roles, the uh, capacity to service uh, millions and oftentimes hundreds of millions of consumers, and then also the time, time to market across public-private partnerships and, and uh, and working with a diverse uh, range of partners is, uh, is very interesting. And I don't think there's a, there's a one-size-fits-all model. I think uh, just trying to get everyone onto the same page about what, what value drivers um, look like for mobile operators. Eleanor, can I put you on the spot and just ask you to, to outline very briefly just the tangible and intangible assets that, uh, that you as, as AT&T have and how that um, you know, how, how you, you, you would evaluate partnerships according to that. Um, happy to. Um, so, obviously from the tangibles, it would be, you know, what they're bringing to the table, whether it is through um, their knowledge on the clinical side, the innovation of the product they're offering. Uh, we evaluate, obviously, also around things like, you know, security, scalability, although these are the things that I think that, you know, AT&T, we are actually able to help uh, with both on the security and the scalability piece. Um, so really, truly, it's, it's looking for the innovative uh, solutions, um, uh, the clinical insights uh, that they can add to the table that would be complementary to what we already have. Um, and it's not just on the software side, it's also on the device side. Um, and some of the other capabilities that are tangible would be, um, you know, when we think about uh, partnerships for scaling up, uh, there is a real need when we roll out with our customers to also look for uh, strong uh, capabilities in helping us to integrate into the workflow of our target customers, whether they are payers or providers. Now, in terms of intangibles, um, you know, it's hard to put a, a finger down on that, but it's, uh, it's, it's a feeling of, you know, shared values of what we're trying to achieve together. So there are so many vendor uh, solutions and partners out there who may have very interesting ideas and solutions that they've prototyped, but if they're not in this journey with us for, uh, you know, a medium term at least to build this business. If they're in here to, um, I hate to be so blunt, but I'll be blunt anyway, to, you know, kind of like, hey, let's just get a fast win so we can cash out, that is not a target um, a partnership that we want to cultivate. And I don't know whether our other panelists have uh, things to add to this. Carlos, could I ask you just to expand on that, so maybe just some prioritization across those assets and, and yeah, totally what you're agree. for totally, digital? Totally agree with Eleanor in terms of the long-term commitment. That's what we're looking for too, not for cashing out partnerships. And we're looking, for instance, at companies that really know how the healthcare sector works because we believe that the first phase always before the deployment of technology is a change management process. So we need to, we partner with consulting firms very specialized in certain areas of the healthcare system in order to redefine the processes and then uh, take advantage of technology. We're also looking for uh, companies 
advanced in uh, developing algorithms and different protocols that allow to uh, anticipate episodes of decompensation before they're going to happen just by or through the analysis of a lot of data that you can collect through different devices. Also, uh, companies that may provide uh, rich user experience devices which are easy to be to wear or easy to use or, or, or can be incorporated to your daily life and, on, and, and make things better or simpler for the user. Also looking at healthcare providers which want to provide services to the end user. For instance, in Latin America, there is a gap between the services, the healthcare services provided by the public system and the top large insurance companies, and that gap uh, is generating a business opportunity because there's a lot of people entering the, the middle class having uh, worry about their health and of uh, the healthcare of, of their relatives that cannot afford a whole insurance but want to have some kind of medical answer, medical response better than the one that the public system can provide. So we're partnering with companies, for instance, in Brazil to offer this kind of microservices that allow the, the user to connect with a nursery call center 24-7 and have some kind of piece of advice regarding their health. So I think there are uh, a range of opportunities to collaborate with different, uh, different partners, different companies. When we, when we look at, uh, at those assets um, and obviously the diversification of products um, moving forward, I think particularly in the last few years when uh, revenues have been squeezed across operator groups around the world, um, and you look at, at traditional data, voice, uh, SMS, and then moving on to the, the enterprise solutions and, and cloud-based and call centers and, and all the other assets that we normally talk about, um, Benjamin, does it, uh, how does it affect Orange, Orange Healthcare in, in terms of partnership development and sweating those assets um, more effectively to develop those, those partnerships? Okay. Well, uh, we're talking about partnership and value of partnership as if uh, there were only one kind of partnership. Actually, I think there are many kinds of partnership and the way the, the move inside the ecosystem uh, change um, the partnership we made, changed the way we partner, uh, um, well, there, there is a huge number of changes there. Let me take some example. Uh, of course, we have simple partnership. Uh, we can see uh, uh, during the, uh, the conference, uh, simple partnership like the one we have with Ideal Life or with Qualcomm. Uh, these guys have almost end-to-end -end solution. They were just looking for connectivity and, well, we do connectivity. So. Basically, this is a simple deal. Uh, when it comes to Africa, for example, um, the partnership we, we value are more with uh, Ministry of Health, for example, because we work a lot on epidemiological survey, on system to, um, for example, to declare birth, uh, on system like Healthline, and there we need to partner with Ministry of Health or with government. And there is, I think, also another kind of partnership which is uh, more important to us is uh, the kind of partnership we, we have with device manufacturers. Um, the world has changed for telcos, but for device manufacturers, the change, uh, changes are still ahead. These guys are going from traditional business model where they used to sell devices and get reimbursed for these devices to a new business model where they, they sell services. And this is a huge deal for them because they don't have the business model. They don't always know how to write specification about the product. And, well, the way we partner with them is we help them to understand what can be the new services they will provide the ecosystem with. We help them to write specification. And then we provide them with the end-to-end -end turnkey solution, taking advantage of the hosting capability we have dedicated to personal medical data uh, tier 1 and tier 2 uh, support system and so on. But it, it always starts with a discussion with the device manufacturer to really understand uh, what is the service behind this connected device, behind this ML solution. And finally, there is also another kind of uh, partnership we made. 
most, mostly with uh, software players. Um, these guys used to have a uh, business model driven by, uh, for example, in, in medical imaging, uh, driven by a system like uh, picture archiving and communication system. Um, these systems were uh, really expensive. Hospital used to buy them and used to use it uh, 10, uh, 15 years just to, uh, to, to get the most out of it. And this industry is getting into the cloud. And the business model is now as a service. And players like uh, General Electric, uh, Mark Kesson, are in partnership with us because they, they need to change the whole business model and the whole way they deliver the service. All these different kinds of, of partnership are for different kinds of markets. And that's why I'm a bit uh, uncomfortable when it comes to, uh, say, well, this kind of partnership is better than this is one. These are different markets. They require different partnerships. So let's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a good point that uh, focusing on a type of partnership and trying to apply a, a, a one-size-fits-all fits model definitely doesn't work. Let's, uh, let's maybe diverse and, and or digress onto, onto the size of a partnership. Um, you know, for, for China Mobile with 700 million consumers, uh, it requires a very different uh, partnership engagement to, to be able to reach that consumer base as well. Um, let, let's start on the very big partnerships. How, how, you know, how, how do you approach that? What are the evaluation and key metrics for that? And, and uh, how, can, how can companies engage at that level? Okay. Uh, I think uh, I have a different perspective uh, regarding answer your questions. The first is uh, about this market uh, diversity, although there's 700 million customers, but there's a huge range of uh, uh, customer needs and people with different income, people living in different regions, people in different health status. So market segmentation is very important to us. Um, so we have to devise different uh, services for, for people uh, in different leads. Uh, for example, in the uh, coastal areas, the metropolitan areas, people might be more worried about this, uh, uh, become aware of their own health status. So these wellness uh, applications, um, especially it's people in uh, open workers, people in uh, what we want to call, like in Beijing, white collar workers. They need something to look after themselves. As, as, as you, you, you may or may not know that recently in China, there are many cases that it's uh, acute death. Suddenly, you know, people in their mid-age suddenly suffer stroke then because they didn't realize such a problem or symptom before. So now uh, there's uh, several nationwide uh, awareness uh, of this kind of event. People in quite the bright stars then suddenly de uh, suffer sudden death. So uh, that's the reason well is that people need to be uh, care about, it. even if they sort of normally feel it's, it's all right, but it need to have early warnings to have this uh, adjust their busy work schedules, adjust their lifestyles. So these kind of applications, we are working um, closely uh, with our partners, uh, with uh, you know, certain cardiovascular hospitals, uh, to develop solutions for this, because there are such huge leads here. But then for the rural areas, that's basically it's uh, to solve the access to medical service, the problem. Um, as, a res as mentioned earlier, re resources is uh, quite scarce in the countryside, in remote regions, um, that still has large populations of uh, uh, live there. Uh, the thing is that uh, whether you know we can develop some tools uh, for the village doctors, for uh, rural health clinics that use this tool um, to, um, to to gather information if they are not so qualified to gather information, clinical information, vital signs about the patient, and follow the uh, defined workflows, and then this information being sent. Uh, a pack together, send over our uh, network, 
to the uh, qualified doctors in county level hospitals, but there the uh, doctors there can uh, ac uh, access the portal and uh, instantly uh, give advice uh, treatment to this um, uh, patient. So that's another. Th th in this case, we need a different partnership and with a different uh, 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 solutions. So what we are looking here, so first is this diverse segment of this market, but then for different market segment or the user segment, we will develop applications for these people. This has happened to be the case that in, although while well, you see the China Mobile is a monolithic company, but it's actually we have 33 operating companies, because in each province, uh, metropolitan cities, and autonomous regions, it has its own uh, um, China Mobile, uh, what you call it, subsidiaries, or the wholly uh, owned subsidiaries. Because they also, based on their own uh, regional leads, their own uh, uh, this economy development, the level of economy development, have different solutions. But then we, we try to actually um, pick up the best practice within different companies. Then from a headquarter point of view, that we then um, get more standardized, have more standardized solutions to those different uh, uh, other uh, regions of a similar development levels of similar leads. So that's, that's an issue. What I see the uh, partnership issue uh, is it, quite actually interesting because also this M House uh, field is actually quite a uh, cross cross industrial sector, cross uh, disciplinary, this this sort of emerging areas. Uh, the whole chain from end to end is, is, is quite long, involve specialities of different kinds and the people with it used to be the case, you know, device manufacturers like Omron or in other cases like in China, Anjong and as Mind Ray, they also you know, do their uh, device business. But then, uh, but now they actually, as, as, uh, as uh, my colleague earlier mentioned, that they also want to develop service-based solutions. So actually, not just selling devices in one go, but then it has tried to get hold of these customers because the solution-based, a service-based basis is to get hold of the customers. But then there are internet uh, service providers. You, you know, you're, they're doing a loads of work about entertainment issues, infotainment issues. Now they also try to get hold of customers. They provide uh, medical information, so related information, uh, provide various, so like apps, provide various knowledge about pregnancy, etc. So these people also want to get hold into, uh, get into this area. Uh, then there are other solution providers who are eagerly uh, uh, looking, looking for entry into this market. So as an operator, we think it's, uh, it's quite natural for us to get into mobile market because, the, uh, as we mentioned earlier, somebody mentioned earlier that the traditional uh, income revenue stream like voice and SMS, etc., I used to be a part of a line share revenues of uh, telecom operators, but this part now has been uh, reduced substantially and also steadily because of all the people can use the sort of uh, free, free phone calls, Skype, uh, uh, this, uh, we, in China we have this WeChat, WeChat. It's actually people now getting used to that. So our revenue is reduced, but then we have to find the new revenue streams but then, because we are also moving, the telecom transformation has been undergoing for over the last 10, 10 years. Uh, we're looking at also moving to mobile internet uh, uh, era, internet stages. So uh, various services like in China, we have these uh, mobile, read, uh, mobile readers, uh, e-books, as uh, mobile music, mobile videos, uh, video streams, various things. So from communications to infotainment, but then we said next step is what about this device because you have mobile phone, everybody has mobile phone. Now it's smartphone, um, uh, the proportion of smartphone owners in China increased very rapidly 
over the last uh, year or two. So it's still a trend. Almost, uh, I think in a few years, everybody will hold a, a mobile phone instead of feature phone. So then people will think that, what so about... Sorry, I'm, I'm going to sorry. interrupt you just because of time. Sorry. We'll secure a keynote for okay. you to address Thanks. opportunities in China for, for 2013. But I think, I think you, raise, you raise a very interesting point there and um, uh, you know, confirm the suspicion that it's in, with 33 holding companies in, in China that it is, it's incredibly complicated to, to enter that market. Um, but I want I wanted, I wanted to ask a question, and this is following on some news recently that you may, may have seen in, in Asia, which is uh, the introduction of a partnership between mobile operators and, uh, and Google, or as we, as we term the, the, the over-the-top players. And traditionally we've seen them as, or, uh, you know, we understand that mobile operators have seen them as, as competition, but now with the, the introduction of this partnership with Google and the offering of Google services, um, what, what can we expect to see in terms of partnership development between mobile operators and, and uh, over-the-top players in the future? I think it's, it's not, uh, you know, before Google left China, Actually, China Mobile has a, a collaboration scheme with Google, which is very mobile, mobile search. Mm. But then, you know, just uh, unfortunately, the Google left, then we have to use, uh, we develop our own search engines or uh, working with the Chinese partners to do that. This is not a, a, a real issue with this top, top uh, IT service or internet service providers. Basically, it is, uh, we have to find out uh, what is what is the part which the opposite party lack lacking? So we can, for example, perhaps Google has a, a very a much sort of experience in their in providing solutions. You get engaging the custom uh, offering custom uh, lead uh, products and services, but then uh, China Mobile you can deliver this can help to deliver this sort of a, a service to a large uh, sort of segment of the uh, populations. Especially, yes. I tried to mention earlier, when some solution providers, they can do something very nicely, but it's in a much small scale in one region or in one city of China, but it's still China Mobile can help this to deliver to the uh, whole nation, nationwide footprint. Sure. Eleanor, you, you're a lot closer to that in, in the U.S. market. Um, has there been much engagement with, uh, with these other top players? And any, um, any focus on healthcare? Uh, not, not that I've personally seen. I mean, we all saw, of course, the exit, very public exit on the PHR side. Um, I, I definitely haven't seen um, those sorts of moves with, with other players. I've not seen it. Uh, I think this discussion with other stuff is quite interesting because uh, when it comes to healthcare services, uh, the, the, the entry point is data security. Uh, when you have a new illness, you don't want it to be on your Facebook page, basically. Uh, when talking about wellness, uh, for example, you go jogging, same path as usual, and you are two minutes better. Well, it's good news. And you want it on your Facebook page. You want to share this data. This is wellness. This is not about privacy or security of the data. This is about openness, uh, sharing, and so on. And I, I do believe that uh, wellness is not Nirvana, but is a place for over the top players because it deals with uh, being able to put data on my Facebook page, being able to network. Uh, um, to compete with my friend. Healthcare services, on the other end, are a totally different market where you need to have physical assets such as hosting facilities, SIM cards, connectivity, uh, to gather in a safe and secure way personal medical data. So I think, well, wellness might be something for over the top player, but healthcare will remain something where mobile operators have a card to play. Carlos, anything uh, from you across the Telefonica to Digital? I, I agree with my colleagues here. I mean, the over-the-top players are not the trusted players in terms of security and privacy, and they are not used to getting into the, the users' homes 
as we are the mobile operators, we've been offering, or the fixed mobile operators, we've been offering services to the home and to the user's hands for many years. We are able to provide them with the customer care they require, and that's something that regarding healthcare and regarding connected healthcare is going to be also pretty important. So, so we don't see a, a very clear threat coming from those uh, kind of companies, but uh, we believe that we have a leading position and we can take advantage of it. Any, any questions from the floor at this stage? I think just while, while we wait for anyone to come up, uh, just another, another question then on the back end of that is what can we expect to see driving forward in terms of partnerships between mobile operators? Not just uh, at, at group level, which, uh, which we also need to see more structured partnerships w within a group, but partnerships between mobile operators to deliver services at scale across, across countries. Well, uh, I think that we have, as mobile operators, an asset that we don't use in healthcare. This is SIM card. Uh, basically, there are SIM cards all over the world, and healthcare is using, for example, in Europe, in, in Spain, this is the case, this is the case in France and Germany, uh, we all use cards to authenticate physician and patient. And basically, because it's another card, the physician are not using it. They just get the card to their PA, and there is no security at all. People leave the card in, in their house, and it doesn't work. But they are using the mobile phone. They have the mobile phone in their pocket. So the SIM card might be an asset we could use to authenticate physician and patient. To do so, we will have to agree with all oh, the telcos to, to use this asset uh, to provide the entire ecosystem uh, with a safe and secure authentication solution. This is one of the ideas. Anyone else want to pick up on that point? And any, any questions from the floor? Please make your way so, to you. I guess the question is, well, what are some of the put, uh, opportunities for mobile operators to collaborate with each other and share? Well, for, for a relatively small operator, uh, although we have 65 million subscribers, nothing in comparison to 700 million, right? But So we, we'd like to really understand what are some of the mature solutions out there that we could leverage in our own market, taking into account obviously local you know, differences in practices, attitudes of healthcare providers as well as con consumers. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel all the time, although there are cases when you really, as, as a matter, it's a local imperative, you need to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. So I think there are opportunities uh, for us look, going forward to work with other um, mobile operators from, from all parts of the world. I have uh, just one more question around um, working with the majority of, of small medium enterprise uh, companies that, that form the majority of uh, attendees at, at uh, these conferences. What, uh, you know, what, what, what provision are, are mobile operators making in terms of incubation of those SME uh, companies, whether it's through uh, an R&D uh, department, whether it's through diversification into uh, new business development or innovation or, or spin-off companies. Um, are, there, are there any great successes that we can point to and, and you know, what, what, what type of strategies exist for, for SMEs to engage with, with mobile operators? I take that one. Yeah. For instance, in Telefonica Digital, we have a venture capital office in Mountain View, California, and we are partnering in identifying startups and small enterprises with uh, breaking through products and services which can be incorporated to our portfolio and can be uh, integrated with our existing products and services. And I've been talking to some, some of these companies here in this event and I think there's a good opportunity. We're also promoting what uh, an incubation program which is called WIDA, which has been launched in, in every country where we operate. We've been launching it in, in Germany, in the UK, in Spain, and all the countries throughout Latin America, where we run a kind of beauty contest between different startups and select 10 of them in different areas, but healthcare is one of them, and then have these companies uh, within our facilities and giving them all the support, economic support, and also management support and marketing support in order to develop their, 
their proposals or take it to the market. And that's another initiative that we have throughout our footprint and which is being really positive in terms of the results we are getting. So these are our main two approaches. Let's go to the floor and uh, if you could just introduce yourself briefly and then direct your question. David Wilcox, Rescale. I came in late. I wasn't going to ask a question, but since nobody else is asking, I'll, I'll, I'll ask one that occurred from the last two sessions. So PwC spoke in a session two sessions ago, and he gave this declension of likelihood of adoption of applications, which started with feeding the beast, which was do things exactly the same as you are, but make more money for the doctor, and went on from there. And then in the next session, a guy named David Weirtz said, if you treat mobile as an add-on, you will fail. So th those to me seem to be two diametrically opposite views of the world. So you guys are one of the few organizations in the value chain who could actually break rank with the established way of doing things and actually have the throw weight to pull it off. If you had the right partners on the innovation side to create the disruption. So the question is, are you considering playing that role? And if so, how are you going to find the disruption partners to play it? And how are you going to get up the courage to disrupt the, you know, how should I say it? <laughs> the, the, the really rich, really powerful current providers. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, that's a wonderful question, and uh, I must say I disagree with the, the PwC guy. Um, I, I think everything is about new usage, and of course we want to partner with people that are thinking ahead, thinking new kind of usage. Your question was, uh, how can we select these partners? Uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, the trick is to work with people that are actually doing healthcare. And these guys have many ideas. When we're talking about uh, medical device manufacturers, uh, they, they really have a vision of what they want to do. They just don't know how to do it. They just don't know how to buy an IT solution uh, or to design an end-to-end -end solution because, well, that is not their business. Uh, so we are available to work with them. And this is because we will design the solution working with them that, well, it will finally happen. Um, so the question is, you know, we have a healthcare system in the U.S. that's, you know, increasing in cost and accelerating, and so how do we disrupt uh, that existing play? Um, and if you look at Pew's research over the last three years, it shows that mobility healthcare application adoption within the U.S. population has pretty much been stasis. So no real change. And I would submit that the answer here isn't, hey, what's the next or the silver bullet that is direct to consumer that blasts away the providers, the existing payer system, and gives us to a new model of care. But rather, I would submit that the answer would be, in order to get more individuals to sustainably adopt mobile applications and connected devices, they need to be, I hate to say this, they need to be part of that workflow and system. You've got 17,000, 20,000, call it what you like, number of wellness, fitness, uh, uh, healthcare applications within the different uh, operating systems today, but the majority of them are untethered. And that's why you're seeing a situation of me to app after me to app after me to app. So to disrupt that system, you need to understand that the economic flows, the clinical workflow, and then to provide the solution that will be a sponsored application, i.e., it meets a critical need for a payer and a provider to roll out to their population, both on a member side and a, a clinician side. So from a developing country perspective, and go back to the, the core idea about disruption, it has to be affordable, cheap. So we're really looking for partners who can deliver cheap, affordable services, devices, applications, and also ways of adoption. So strategy, the, the big problem for us is when we have mobile devices and apps for consumers, we find out that they need to connect to applications in hospitals and clinics. Guess what? 
very little is, is out there. So we need people to also provide uh, solutions for enterprises, but given the dismal record of electronic medical records adoption in, in, in rich countries like the U.S., even up to today, then we need really uh, methodologies and strategies for adoption in a rapid way, especially uh, you know, taking into consideration uh, greenfield uh, situations like, like what we found for ourselves. I think it's, it, it's interesting that uh, uh, there's an evolution of the conversation beyond uh, talking about disruption, we're not talking about support. And I think that, that's because we as a mobile industry are now learning more about healthcare, um, which, is, which is obviously a good thing. So hopefully next, next year when we're up on the stage, we can start talking about the impacts of, of the world and how they've disrupted, uh, disrupted healthcare through supporting them. Uh, second question there. Yeah. Just short comment uh, about what you just said. Uh, I, I totally agree with you. And um, for example, we work a lot in, in African countries, and be, because people there uh, were facing uh, supply chain, drug supply chain issues, we came up with a really simple solution to enable the end user to check if a drug is genuine or not. It's quite simple. It just put a scratch code on the box, you scratch the code, and you send it to a short, uh, a short number. And if we know this box, we just don't say, well, this is a genuine drug, or, well, we don't know that box, go and check with your, your chemist. Uh, this is really disruptive, because in the pharmaceutical supply chain, it gives the power to the patient. It enables the, the control of the drug by the patient. And we, we've been talking with uh, pharmaceutical players in, in Europe, in the United States, and, well, most of them are interested by this solution because, well, it's a new usage coming from the developing world. My name is Mitzi Sellers with Effect Consulting. My question is a bit about how the mobile network operators are thinking of ways that they could potentially work together as they move into the, the mobile technology or mobile health space. Um, and I guess my, my, the background of this, I, I'm sorry, this isn't a succinct question, but the background of this is that in a number of countries in Africa where I've worked, I've seen that certain mobile network operators have coverage, maybe they have the, the preponderance of the market, but they still aren't covering the whole country. And when, when some other partners, whether it's the Ministry of Health or other international players, um, try to undertake some kind of a mobile health program, if they go with just a single mobile network operator, they'll disregard whether it's 30 percent or 50 or 80 percent of the population. And so one of the groups that I'm working with is working with a, um, through an aggregator so that we can work across all of the different mobile network operators. But that basically cost of things like SMS or the data transfer because you have that middleman to work across the mobile network operators. Therefore, the whole program is much more expensive. What are your thoughts on that? How, how are you thinking about um, the applicability of, of what you're generator, generating and innovating across other mobile network operators in a given country so that we can have great coverage and great services? Um, I, I totally hear you there from that, that issue. You know, um, So let's take the U.S. example, right? I mean, if AT&T only rolled out healthcare solutions that worked on the AT&T network, you will only have the AT&T uh, people who choose to have that coverage. But when you go to a hospital or a payer, that's not, not how they think about their membership or their consumer or their patient base, which is why the healthcare solutions that need to be rolled out that are driven by mobility need to be cross-carrier. And that means that for all of us here at the table, we should be rolling out solutions that should work regardless of whatever network the end user uses. And that's that shift in thinking from all telco carrier thinking to the way we should be thinking about this going forward. Absolutely. So when we sell our solutions, we're not selling to generate the data or the voice network or even the phones. We're actually selling the solution. So think of this as software as a service, you know, yeah. 
Yeah, just to add that we are following the same model in our countries, and we are not paid for voice or communications or for data, but even for medical outcomes. I mean, we are connected patients. They can be subscribers of Orange, for instance, in Spain, or Vodafone, or, or Telefonica, but they can use our over-the-top service, and we're getting paid by the, by the provider, by the healthcare provider, because his, uh, they are saving money because they are using our service. It's more related to the value that we are able to add at the healthcare part or part of the service more than at the traditional core communication service. David Locks, a uh, quick question. Yes, I'm David Aylward. I, I was privileged to be the first executive director of the M Health Alliance and partnered with GSMA uh, and, and many of you in, in, in this enterprise and others. And I wanted to comment that first, uh, there's no industry that has done more for the four billion people at the base of the pyramid across the globe uh, than the wireless industry. Um, uh, while the rest of us who work in these issues sat around and talked about doing good things, the wireless industry, and not for charity, went out and built a network that has revolutionized people's lives everywhere. Um, and so as a disruptive, positive force, I congratulate you. And, and I particularly know about SMART, uh, not, not, not the others, but SMART continues to innovate, and I congratulate you, sir. My question is, the industry made some collective decisions that made that happen. You really focused on cheap handsets and how to design cheap handsets, and they brought a collective force together for the base of the pyramid. And my request to you is you do the same thing for healthcare because I know you're not going to be disruptive in American healthcare. I've given up on American healthcare. You're going to support the big payers, fine, whatever. But you can get together because everybody in the world should have an electronic health record and you can do it. And you can do it and make money. But if we get a cheap healthcare record, everybody can have one, but it needs to be interoperable between carriers. There need to be a cheap set of services that, that the base things behind that the apps can, we don't need any more apps right now, but we do need carrier strength systems. And the people, the innovators I represent, the 600 Ashoka fellows around the world, healthy wallets, are not gonna build security systems. They're not gonna build authentication systems. They're not gonna build ID systems. But man, they could run much better social enterprises and show you how to make value at the base of the pyramid. If you would come together and offer that basic platform of health software, wellness software at the base of the pyramid around the world because I think you would build on this wonderful thing you've already done and make a lot of money and create value as you do it. Anyone want to pledge allegiance to <laughs> world peace? <laughs> so I think, David, that's more, it's more a comment than a question. Yeah. Or it's, it's, it's a statement. It's, it's an RFP without <laughs> but it's, also, it's also a good segue. And just to close, is uh, GSMA's role in, in, in bringing the mobile operators together. I mean, we have a number of initiatives um, uh, foremost in healthcare is the, the Pan-African M Health Initiative, bringing mobile operators together in a collaborative way across many countries to, to launch health services. We launched the M Identity, which has got a big focus on registration, uh, SIM Identity, One API. So there, there are a lot of initiatives happening within GSMA to bring uh, uh, mobile operators together in a more unique way. Um, also, the, the efforts of uh, Continue and the M Health Alliance and other industry organizations, there's a huge responsibility on, on these organizations to collectively drive industry. Um, so we are at, at uh, a closing time. We've run slightly over. I apologize for that. But let me just uh, thank our, our panelists. Thank you for your input, your contributions. And uh, if uh, we could just give our, our panelists a big uh, hand. Thank you. I close if there are any other questions, if you could just come up and uh, ask those directly to our, our panelists. Thank you.